Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can, I think the people in the room can hear me well. Um, sounds like people on Zoom can hear as well. Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, um, hello everyone. My name is Asan. I'm the uh, president for the AI in Medicine Student Society. Um, and this course is brought to you by AIMS and the um, Faculty of Medicine and the Department of Dentistry and Dr. Hollis Lai. Um, and uh, we're gonna get started with just a few reminders. If I can move to the next slide, there we go. Um, okay, so the elective uh, or the course is uh, gonna be 12 sessions. Uh, we're gonna run the course uh, synchronously each Wednesday from six to 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to be here at, in this room at Kate's 1080, and we're also going to have it on Zoom as well. Um, and based off of uh, having 12 sessions and also not having a lecture during reading week, we're going to go into April, which I was trying to avoid, but um, we'd, we'd rather have reading week than um, not go into April. So, um, And then please bring your own devices um, to the lectures, because uh, we're going to get hands-on sometimes. Um, we're going to provide some resources for you to use at your own time, uh, so stay tuned for those. The lectures are also being recorded. I've had a few emails about that, but um, it is actually being recorded over Zoom, uh, so those links will, will be shared as well. Um, so this is a bit of an important reminder for everyone. So for those of you who are claiming um, this course as an elective hour, um, which is the medical students in their first, um, uh, first year and second years, um, there are going to be assignments for you to complete before the completion of the course. It's not going to be too much, so don't worry about it. Um, and you also need to attend synchronously um, to actually get those um, get the credit. So watching the recordings doesn't count. So you have to be either in person or over Zoom um, for to claim um, elective credits. If you are claiming professional development credits and you're graduate students um, and you're claiming that, you also need to be in attendance synchronously, either over Zoom um, or in person. Um, for those of you who are wanting to get a certificate, uh, so if the first two doesn't apply to you, this might apply to you. Um, the certificate is gonna be from the AI and Medicine Student Society. So this is not a U of A certificate. I'm gonna say that right now so that the U of A uh, lawyers don't come after me after. Um, so the certificate is going to be from Ames. Um, but to get that, you need to um, attend the lectures and also um, do an end of course test. Um, for those though, attending the lectures doesn't have to be synchronous. So you can actually um, do that asynchronously. So watch the recordings, but you would have to do it through the link we give you so that Zoom actually can track your attendance um, that way. Um, okay, and, oh, I just realized we are not sharing our screens over Zoom. Great, uh, let's see. This here. Okay. That first point was very on, like, um, very to the time, I guess. So this is the third time we're running this course, um, but it's also the first time we're running it at this large of a scale. So please be patient um, and provide feedback, which is why we have that feedback question at the end of the attendance um, tracker. So at the end of the lecture, we're going to put that up again. Uh, so you can go back and um, essentially change, change your responses. Um, meaning you can add feedback um, to that form. Please ask questions and engage during um, the lectures uh, to learn more. There are no silly questions. Uh, we're all here from different backgrounds and we're all here to learn. So um, ask questions and engage. If you'd like even more AI in healthcare, um, we're running the fourth annual AI in healthcare conference, um, which is gonna happen in March 10th to 12th um, this year. Uh, it's a hybrid event, and the in-person section is going to be running at the Matrix Hotel in Edmonton. Uh, you can register through that QR code at the top. Um, also, uh, that link, once I share the slides with you, um, we recommend you attend in person because we have a lot of um, great uh, sessions planned. 
Um, so there's a mixer, there's networking and career opportunities, lots of talks and applications and ethics of AI in healthcare. Um, we're going to have workshops uh, that are going to be more hands-on, panel discussions, and a lot of other stuff as well, a lot of free stuff as well. Um, if you're doing research in AI in May, um, please come and talk to me afterwards because we want your help. Um, but also you can submit an abstract um, to the conference as well because we have um, student presentations um, in the conference too. The link is there. Again, you can access it once we share the slides with you. Uh, and if your um, abstract get accepted, you get a free in-person ticket. Not that the in-person tickets are expensive. They're literally $11 something. And it's just that people show up. Um, so we're not charging to get any sort of benefit from it. Okay, um, and you've seen this slide before. So this is the attendance tracker. Um, this is your last chance in the beginning of the lecture to track your attendance. We're gonna show this again at the end of the lecture. Um, it's not gonna um, go anywhere per se. And real quick, in terms of the syllabus, what to expect from the course, Today is the intro to AI in medicine. Um, so Dr. Hollis Lai is gonna um, present today. Um, we have the introduction to programming Python and Google Colab uh, next week um, and major Python libraries that are relevant to AI the week after that. Um, we're gonna do some, uh, we're gonna do a lecture on medical data and pre-processing in the second section, um, as well as an introduction to AI models and applications, which is a quick overview of those. Um, and we're going to do an ethics, privacy, and fairness in uh, medical AI after. Uh, then it's going to be reading week, and then section C um, and D are going to be the AI in certain medical specialties. So we're going to start in generally intro to AI in medical specialties, um, and we're going to go into public health and infectious disease first, uh, then neurology and neurosurgery, uh, radiology, pathology, and cardiology. Um, the people from these specialties are not going to like us because we tried three different specialties in one lecture. We'll see how that works. Um, AI and genetics, omics, and oncology after that. Um, and then we're going to get into evaluating medical AI literature um, and do a case-based learning, conclude, and wrap up at the end. Um, so if there are no questions with these, I will hand it over to Dr. Lai. Just a slide from inside. Just a slide from inside. How about the? Oh, oh, I just got it. I'll go on this yeah. one. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, so if you have questions uh, as you're going along, the way that you questions uh, you ask your questions, you, you can go through Zoom, and uh, I think the team over here will be answering your question in vivo. That it's, I will keep going while this will uh, you can get your uh, questions immediately answered. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Thanks. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, giving you an introduction to AI today. So put up your hand if you understand what artificial intelligence is. Put up your hand, don't be shy. All right, now leave your hand up if you've used artificial intelligence. Put up your hand, anybody. Come on, don't be shy, yeah, All right? Anybody use Siri before, All right? All right, what about, have you actually used artificial intelligence in health? Okay, do you want to provide an example of how you use that? That's great. Thank you. So as you can see, there are many different types of exposure in health. Okay, so have you put up your hand if you've modified and trained intelligent tools to do a task that you need. So maybe not AI, but you've trained a task to do something. All right, there's still a few of you. Okay, all right. Um, and lastly, you've created AI before. Put up your hand if you've created AI before. You don't have to write the script. Just because you're, 
sure you've uh, you created a script for a uh, for networks before, All right? So there are some initiated folks uh, in the room today. So I just wanted to make sure that today is going to likely be a breeze for everybody because I think that AI is pervasive and that everybody has a good understanding of how all of this work. Uh, going through today to see whether or not we have enough time, we're going to go through some of the basic definitions and the history of how that works. We're going to work, uh, walk through a little bit of a training on how training is involved, because much like most of you, AI is all about training the computer to do what you want it to do. And that's super great about AI, but then we're going to talk a little bit more about how it relates to medicine and how you're able to use it for your needs. And finally, we're going to also consider some of those uh, begin the discussion on how privacy and ethical use of AI, but uh, it will be covered on later on in the group. Okay, so what is AI? I gave you a few examples here. For those of you, uh, for those of you that are familiar with University of Alberta, obviously we are the pioneers of AlphaGo. Right, We've, uh, we're the, one of the first institu uh, institutions that solve Go. For others, in terms of the media, the depiction of what AI looks like, it could be a totally immersive simulation environment, right? In terms of controlling every single aspect of how you do what you do and how you function. But there is a very wide understanding in terms of how that actually influences what you do. Has anybody ever seen this before? Put up your hand if you recognize or know this part right here. Pim eyes. What does Pim eyes do? Anybody? So, for those of you that feel like you feel free to Google as you go along, um, <clears throat> Pim eyes is uh, a reverse search engine for your uh, for images. It is creating all kinds of issue right now in terms of. Uh, the ethical use of information and how an artificial intelligence is actually fed in order to look. You can do basically a reverse lookup based on faces to see who that person is. Uh, so for those of you that want to look into the types of challenges that this type of AI is used, please feel free to look. Uh, it's all over in the, in the, um, uh, in the news uh, right now. And I also have something that's a, a, a little bit, um, it's a drawing. It's a drawing by Dolly. And I, I used this uh, about a few weeks ago at another class. Um, the description for this was medical students studying in a modern painting. And here you go. AI is actively drawing an image for us. So this was generated as a generated art by Dolly. Um, brought to you by the same folks that brought to you, uh, that brings you Chad GTP. But at the same time, how it actually impacts what you think, uh, what people actually think they do is, for example, autopilots. So people think that um, you know, in terms of how reinforcement uh, learning works is how the algorithm is actually detecting the environment and adapting the vehicle to its environment. So as you can see, there's many different approaches towards artificial intelligence. There's many different methods of going about it, and it impacts your life very differently. But all the way down from daily life use to how you interact and how you communicate. Everybody has a different understanding of how this all works. So where do we go from here in terms of how do we get a common understanding? So artificial intelligence can be broken down into the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. So. If you consider the machine as a whole, you would just have artificial intelligence as something that produces and be able to um, be able to actions within the machine. So it considers the actual um, the the actual machine as a whole in in terms of functioning and performing a task. This is in contrast to some of the old uh, this definition of machine learning, such that it's a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed. So what that means is, okay, it's self-learning, it's self-taught, right? And finally, to differentiate the three different concepts is that there's also something called deep learning. 
So deep learning is used to describe the computational models that are composed of multiple layers, more than one, in order to learn the representations of data with multiple levels of abstraction. Okay, so what I want to take away for you here to understand is that artificial intelligence usually describes the mechanism, the software, the app as a whole in order to perform a task. Machine learning is the algorithm or is the method that actually enables that learning task for self-learning, whereas deep learning is just a subtask of machine learning that allows you to learn using multiple layers of instantiation. Uh, sure. No, we likely can't do uh, closed captioning until next class. It has to be enabled as a user. All right. So how that all functions and how that all works is in def uh, by definition, we have the classical definition of how digital computer controlled by robots can uh, perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. So doing a task that's intelligence, that's the from the Britannica encyclopedia versus chat GPT, uh, uh, GPT tries to explain, explain artificial intelligence in simple terms. So here that's, the, uh, that, that's the AI generating its own definition about itself. It's actually very meta, if you think about it, trying to explain itself, introduce itself. So there's many different ways of understanding how artificial intelligence work, but to simplify the understanding, it goes down to form to function, and that the function itself is artificial intelligence. The algorithms used is uh, described generally as machine learning, and deep learning is just a specific type of machine learning that takes multiple levels of instantiation uh, of uh, rep uh, abstract representation. So how does it all work? Usually it involves a process of training. There is a performance uh, aspect in terms of looking at how it's being trained. And then at the end, you evaluate. Very much similar to how all of this works in your classroom today. We teach you something we train you, you go through some sort of exercise performance, and then we evaluate, we give you a test. It's almost as if learning, training, and going to school all kind of functions in the same way in how artificial intelligence work, where we actually are mimicking, they are, uh, artificial intelligence actually are, is mimicking how we're training us. Now, <clears throat> usually in artificial intelligence, there is a network approach towards understanding. And in a, in the easiest way for us to explain to you how the, all of this work is, there is usually an input uh, of some information, data, images, what have you. And there is an output, which um, can be an outcome, can be a classification, can be different types of um, categories. And in the middle is the processes that's required in order to understand the different aspects, okay? And we'll go through each of these processes to kind of explain to you how all, they all function together in order to produce, um, when you're providing an input, pro, uh, uh, a, a desired input into a desired output for classification. So this is commonly known as a neural network and in a round out, uh, in a black box way of understanding is that there's input, there's output, something happens in the middle. Now, the training bit is what's relevant towards each of these nodes. So you have a node that can take input and it produces output. But the process of how you would go about to learn something, how you get the computer to learn what you, in, uh, what you intend it to do is What's, uh, it's what's called training. And there are many different, uh, we have three. Funciona? 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 And you wanna, you wanna chat it? Yeah, thanks. All right, so, <clears throat> and there are the different, uh, here we have an example. We'll just consider the student Tarek. 
has a take-home quiz due tomorrow, too lazy to study. The quiz is one question long. There's a, it's a multiple choice, but they get as many attempts as they would. What do you think would happen here? Take it as many times as you want, but it's a multiple choice. Anybody? Yeah. Just try all the answers. Just try all the answers, right? Okay. First to answer, mitochondria is something of the cell. Oh no, I didn't get it right. All right. Goes back, tries it again. Okay, well then it's the powerhouse. All right. So that's one way of conquering a problem, right? Just brute force, trying every single combination, right? Now, what if the professor actually gotten wise to it? Maybe one question is too simple. We're gonna give you more exercise to do. So here is another take-home quiz. Now this time, there is 10 pages. There's 10 questions, each one question per page. You can try as many times as you want, so Tarek has to complete all of this, but the orders of the question will be randomized with each attempt, okay? So what that means is, how, what do you think will happen this time? You have 10 different questions and you have infinite number of tries. What do you think would happen? What's that? Yeah. Same scenario, just longer, right? Still won't study. So if Tarek gets a question wrong, just change the answer on the next attempt. So for those of you that played, um, what's that, what that board game called? Um, the one that you kind of guess? What? Sorry? Uh, I, no, it's not. Wordle, that, you're supposed to know the word. Uh, that there's a, there's a, a different code. Is it a code breaker or something like that? If, for, is it code names, I think? I think so. Yeah. There's different colors, and then you choose different colors of combination kind of thing. No, I'm too old for you guys. All right. So, um, but basically, you're trying to brute force once again. You're trying to go through every permutation of what you're trying to uh, understand. So, the first time, guess all the A's, right? Gets the results. All right. So, you know, stay at question one, two, and five with the A's, and then. For those questions, they say at A, they're going to try the Bs for the, uh, all the remaining questions, right? Oh, gets 50% correct, so learns it very quickly. Gets a third attempt, list out all the ones that they still got it wrong, list out all the Cs, and then finally, the last attempt, which is usually four because there's only four tries, you'll get 100% correct, okay? So that's in a nutshell, it's describing to you that process of learning so that you are trying to understand the, nav the navigation of all the different permutations of the answers, knowing that there is a finite combination of how the answers can be lined up. So, Tarek's performance improves slightly, ever so slightly, but it is going through each of the attempts, going through all the possible permutations and getting the feedback most importantly, the feedback that you have in order to inform the next set of guesses, okay? So in a way, Tarek is training, learning, not from the book, but likely learning something. Okay, the third example here, we have Tarek learning from a pop quiz. Now there's five pages, so that means there's five questions. There's one question per page, but this time there's only one attempt. So knowing all the information that they've had before our questions were similar, yes, they'll have to go and panic and have to study. But likely, this means taking all the uh, information that they've had before, and there's only one attempt on answering these questions. So the questions look relatively similar in terms of looking at how these questions work and you'd be able to answer some of the, uh, the answers in the way that it's predictable towards what the expected uh, 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 wording would be on those questions. So in a roundabout way, here it gets 80% in this one. So what just happened here? The first type, 
pair gets and gives a random guess. If it's correct, you continue. If it's not, change the answer, guess again, right? That in itself is the process of training. And this process of training is actually what is happening when you're training an artificial intelligence uh, approach or machine learning approach in terms of getting to the outcome from the input process and all of that process into the desired outcome. And Tarek's final performance, when it's evaluated, the questions were similar, but it's not quite the same. So sometimes Tarek can recognize those are the questions that they've answered, but at the end, Tarek did okay, but had they, he actually studied rather than just playing at odds, might have done better, okay? So this is an example of how training works on iterative process, multiple rounds. And that's how, that's an example of how artificial, intelli uh, uh, art artificial intelligence gets trained. Any questions up to this point? So when it says, if correct, continue, that continue is referring to the fact that you was correct, but also made an association of what was like the question is asked. Yes. So the important part is that there is feedback. There's constant feedback in order to kind of uh, reiterate that process, right? So knowing that, okay, I got it right. An algorithm would say, I got it right. I'm not going to change the parameters on that outcome. Whereas if they got it wrong, they'll keep changing it again, just to make sure that they can see whether or not they can get the right combination. Okay. So what, Eric, uh, what Tarek actually did was exactly what artificial intelligence does. But when we're talking about training, it happens in each and every one of these nodes. Each nodes function independently in terms of how it's being trained, in terms of what type of information is inputted, and in terms of how one, uh, one set of nodes is passing on information from one set to the other. So, to give you a closer example of what actually happens, rather than Tarek, we're going to go look at how we train inputs between dogs and cats. It's funny because my summer student did that, uh, did this before. Um, <clears throat> he was able to do soccer ball and football, but not dogs and cats. So who knows? But what happens here is that the input is very simple. Dog, a picture of a dog or a picture of a cat. Those are the all possible uh, problem space that you would have. And the output is just a simple categorization, a binary categorization of either dog or cat. Now, for those of you that are paying attention, what type of attributes is different from a cat and a dog? If you were trying to train this, yes. Whiskers, so existence of whiskers, anybody else? Really? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, muzzles. Yeah. This guy right there. Okay, anybody else? So we got whiskers, we got muzzles. This isn't a trick question. This is simply looking at a cat and a dog. Go ahead. Okay, color patterns, right? Okay, so shape and uh, a proportion of the faces, nose pattern, textures, shape of eyes, sounds, sounds. Want a picture? Size, oh, that's better. Head. All right. So as you can see, everybody has a preconceived notion of what that should be. Okay. So when you're training this approach, all you're trying to do is to get stochastically, which means that you don't get to control what is being trained. Each one of these nodes represents some sort of feature and some sort of, uh, and some sort of attributes that is actually classifying. It may be that it's a node about whiskers. It may be that it's a node about muzzles. It may be that there is another node that classifies based on color patterns. We don't know what's happening, likely. And all you're trying to, all this neural network is trying to do is to kind of tease out all of these types of approaches by being fed many, 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 many examples of pictures. Okay, so same way as how Tarek learned, which is 
I answer a bunch of questions. I got the yes or no. For the ones that you get to know, uh, so the ones that you get no, you change your parameter so that you fit the output, the dog and the cat, or, or the cat classification to the correct corresponding picture, okay? That's the training process. Now, when it comes down to the evaluation, that's how you go about to check how well the network has learned, right? So in this case, you can see that, all right, this is now 50%. And it's almost as if it's a little bit biased. And you can say that the next time you get a 50% is that uh, on a test, is that it's no better than random guessing because there's only two outcomes and you got two of your four attempts correct. Okay? So that's the baseline of how you would start evaluating. But once you start to train, uh, once, in addition to training what's inside each of these nodes and what they represent, you can start to incorporate more complex ways of representing your data structure. So it may be that you're, uh, you're assembling more patterns, okay? It may be that you first classify for colors but then the colors would also uh, look at different patterns of the nose. Well, it may be that they're looking at different shapes. And then once you have the shapes, then you're looking at the, the, the subsequent uh, combination of shapes along with the whiskers. There are many different ways of working through this process, but it's through this fine tuning of how you go about to take, adjust your network structure and adjust the way that you're taking and adjust the ways that you're inputting the information, representing the information in different layers, representing the information in, uh, in different combinations. That's how machine learning begins to train. And that's how you're able to approximate information that is closer to the accuracy of what you go through. Okay. So after different rounds of training, several hundred rounds, different combination of networks, different combination of how you go about, we, you probably want to use convolutional uh, approach, and we'll talk more about that uh, in the future ones, in the future sessions of how you go about to do this type of work. So let's say you finish training, okay? At the end of the training sets, you go and you have, you're able to get to about 85% correct, okay? You, how, how would you know whether or not this actually works in reality? What would you do? Let's say that for the 200 uh, images that you've trained it up against, and it's able to correctly identify for those 200 images, 85% of them correct. How would you know whether or not this will work in real life? Yeah. Give it another set perhaps a set that hasn't been seen before, right? So now we wanna look at new images. We wanna feed more unseen images to see whether or not it will work, right? So now we have brand new set of images in order to see whether or not it's a cat and a dog, okay? Why is Judy Dench in here? I did not notice this. <laughs> All right. So, what? Um, so when you're trying to validate, okay, when you're trying to validate your training algorithm, you feed at the end of it, you try to feed it with new images, unseen images. So that means when you're trying to source out your training set, always need to have new set of images or unexposed in order to validate your outcomes, okay? So that's super great that AI can identify and classify between dogs and cats, but what does any of this have to do with medicine? Well, when it comes down to what AI needs to know about medicine, let's, let's think about the process of how a patient is reported. Patient has a chief complaint. What type of red flags could there be in the uh, uh, complaints? What type of diagnosis could it be uh, coming from the chief complaints? 
What kind of procedures do they need to do in order to narrow down this list of possible diagnosis? So if you're thinking about, for those of you that are thinking about the process of how you go about a, a clinical diagnosis, what investigations do you need to do in order to uh, identify which is the cause of this chief complaint? And what are some of the treatments that are available once you're certain on your diagnosis and how effective are they, right? So these are the, 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 the general tests and the general type of processes that every patient comes in and you basically run through all of these types of uh, outcomes. Is there other types of use cases that AI may need to know about medicine? I'm looking at our friend back there because that's not you know, the, the use of AI for the, of, at a population level, that's all brand new. This is on a patient to patient basis, right? Now we're looking at an epidemiological basis. And then every now and then you can do a sub-segment basis analysis. You can mine it in many different ways, right? But in general, you can break the pro, you can break the, 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 uh, the use cases down into prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and then precision medicine basically marries all for, uh, three of them all at the same time. Okay? Prevention meaning that you don't want it, you don't want a, a disease from uh, stop it from happening or stop it from getting it worse. Diagnosis is finding the right answer in terms of looking for the right diagnosis. Treatment is okay after you've di a diag uh, after you've diagnosed an, uh, a uh, after you've made diagnosis. What are you going to do about it? That optimizes the chance of care, right? So we have a few of the applications that you may be able to use an application for AI. So an ex example, a key example of this is actually pretty well known in the um, in the literature as well as in um, the newspapers. Okay. Everybody knows what an ECG is here, right? What is an ECG? Electro, electrocardiogram, okay. What does it do? It, come on, you should know, like, isn't cardio right now? <laughs> Looking at you folks. <laughs> no? <laughs> All right. Okay. You got to buy for the year ones. All right. So what does it represent? Anybody? Is your heart beating normally? All right. So a pattern that functions, it takes your heartbeat. It looks at whether or not it's regulating uh, the, uh, your heart, which is a pump, and whether or not it's working properly. Okay. Pattern it picks up. From a, uh, it generates a pattern, right? That tells you whether or not the functionality of that pump is functioning, right? And it's by measuring the electrical impulses in order to do so, okay? So it's very much like a radio signal that you would have. But hey, wait a minute. It's looking at whether or not a pump is working normally and it's an electrical signal. So that means if it's not working normally, then that means heartbeats will have an unexpected pattern, right? Or it's a pattern outside of the norm. The assumption is that the pump that's working here is working on a very um, repeated basis. It's on a consistent basis, right? So during AFib, the atria of the heart beats regularly, uh, beats rapidly and irregularly, right? So this would be a sign of whether or not your heart is working as expected or not. So there's different uh, obvious symptoms in terms of looking at the ECG in order to identify that. Uh, show of hand, who's got the Apple Watch that does that now? Anybody? Anybody wearing a what, Apple Watch? Yeah? What's that? Oh, Samsung does that too, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Not, 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 not showing brand preferences here, All right? But the, uh, I think the article in 2021 is an Apple Watch or a study, but, ah, right? So takes a pattern, okay? And this is where computers are great at patterns. It picks up on whether or not 
it's able to use AI in order to recognize the type of patterns that collect continually gets collected. And it's trained on 180,000 patients with 600,000 uh, different ECGs. And after that approach, it's able to figure out pretty accurately over 90% in detecting AFib, right? And that's why you have it in your watch today, because it's a simple matter of taking a pattern and recognizing whether that pattern is outside of the norm of the expected pattern. Right? That's what AI is great for. It's able to take patterns, expectations, and whether or not it's compared to an expected pattern or an unexpected pattern or an unknown pattern, right? Very classic case of how AI can be used. And throughout this course, as you've known, uh, as you'll note, uh, notice, uh, you'll get different papers, you'll get different segments of how this can be applied in order to use some of the, uh, these, uh, in order to, uh, for, uh, to demonstrate how some of these use cases work. Another example of how this could work is in the context of radiology. So, uh, oh, nobody's in year three here. You haven't gone through onc. All right. So I can't really say, is this cancer? Nobody would know. Oh, no. Right? Now, this is a mammogram, right? Here is a nodule. What would you do? Whether or not you can tell uh, it's, a, uh, it's cancer. Anybody think that's cancer? OK. Can, can you choose the biopsy? Oh, okay. well, you, well, I said, is this cancer? Yes or no? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a safe course of action. Biopsy. I'm not unsure? Biopsy. Yeah. But the example here that's pro uh, provided is the different imaging of the, uh, the, uh, of the uh, different uh, view of the mammogram. And in fact, this is cancer. So zero of the six board certified radiologists in that study, that's those guys over there, got that correctly identified as cancer, but AI got it right. So AI was able to find it. Why is that? Once again, likely needs more information and needs more training. Just because it's an artificial intelligence that's able to pick up on that pattern doesn't ne does not necessarily mean that you're able to classify for uh, uh, cancerous uh, nodes. As a radiologist, it also means that you have standards act that you need to uh, meet, patient's age, to get different consideration of breast cancer history, previous screening results. It could be, it could be speculated, but we don't quite know. But as um, that as you've mentioned over there, maybe you want to choose to, uh, maybe it's suspicious enough to, uh, to, to uh, pursue biops. You may want to go through medical school. You may want to go through residency in order to get that training. So all of this is the human process of how you would go about to classify, to train enough of information, enough context, enough of uh, background information so that you are able to use and basically do that same quiz that Tarek did so that you could go through and have mammograms diagnosed, okay? That's just for an example of there. But on the other hand, breast cancer is the second leading cause of uh, death. It can be caught very easily if there's consistent mammogram and it can be treated. So if we're concerned about how this works and if we're concerned about how much time it takes in order to diagnose and in order to interpret these mammograms, team of researchers in the UI, uh, UK and the US developed an AI in order to um, diagnose breast cancers on mammograms. So here's the different types of visions that they would have. You can take this information, feed it back into, again, some sort of neural network approach, probably convolutional. And they were able to achieve, after training from 28,000 women, they're able to get about a, redu a reduction of about 5% in false positive, and reduction of false negative uh, up to 10%. Okay. So again, picking up on patterns that are known, 
training against a large sample data set, and then being able to pick up on patterns that are likely missed by humans. Another classic case of how AI can be used. And finally, and this is something that um, we all pursue here, is that in the previous, uh, in, in how medicine, medical treatments is commonly presented, is that medicine usually is a one size fits all. You have some diagnosis, and then you provide a treatment that works for all cases of present uh, of diagnosis. Right? That really doesn't work quite like that. And that's why we have something called the precision medicine. And the reason for this is because there's different permutations and different mutations of how this works, specifically in cancer, where this is the type of the different type of combination uh, and how the treatment works is really down to how this type of pattern is mutation. And it's the, in the interaction between the mutated cell and the presentation of that that interacts with the DNA protein in order to create a mutated protein. So that means every single approach towards how you go about to detect it, how you go about to treat it may be different because the outcome of the mutated protein may require a different solution. So when it comes down to how you go about to solve this problem of precision medicine, well, you have 100,000 different permutations of tumors. Some are benign, some are not. There are risks that are brought up by, um, by the patients. But all of this information here is starting to paint a picture that when it comes down to a patient, they bring their own, uh, they bring their own history. You have your, uh, you have your uh, in vivo information, which is what type of uh, patient presentation that you have. And all of this information goes towards the oncologist in order to figure out how all of these combinations work to, uh, to one another. So this is what the BC Genomics Program does, is that by sharing all the different types of uh, data on all spectrums of how the patient data, as well as some of the treatment data, as well as the lab data, then that's the, the, the genomics program so that you can figure out what type of combination, all the different permutations of how the protein is being presented in, and in order to sequence and analyze for a solution. So in a nutshell, there are many ways for AI to work in medicine and many more ways of discovery that you can use. It doesn't have to be just about discovery in this specific approach. You can think of, you can probably sit me here as med students, you can probably think of many different ways of applying pretty much similar approaches towards how you would go about to, to do this type of discovery work. And the opportunities are endless in terms of how you can go about to use the same approach to solve common problems that we currently see in medicine. That being said, <clears throat> Even though AI is very powerful, there's also a lot of consequences. There's a lot of risks in doing so because of how powerful it is. Is it bias? Is there concern for privacy since there's always a need for more information? What about the ethical use? Whether or not you have consented for the information to be used the way that you want it to use? to be used. An example of this is where <clears throat> there is an ethicist uh, from Google that got fired. Originally, they co-authored a paper on critical of large neural networks built to analyze languages. That being said, when you train a network model, when you train a model, it requires a lot of carbon costs. What that means is it requires a lot of energy expenditure, right? It's kind of like Bitcoin mining. You have to go through all the different permutations in order to find out, in order to train on many, many exobytes of data in order to find solutions. This huge amount of homogenous language, it's not recognizing the racism, the sexism, or what's known as Twitter. And it's also not 
Uh, it's, it's also, uh, AI is also risking a generating misleading or false statements or propagating misinformation. The concern for veracity of information, it's not quite solved right now. So how are you going to find, when, when someone kind of talks about all these things, Google fires it, right? All of these are challenges that we face and nobody wants us to know. Another use. Huh. So one of the challenges with doing this um, is the use of images, the use of images in public spaces. It's a challenge. So Cadillac Fairview, uh, the folks that are brought to you by large malls in Canada, embeds cameras into the kiosks, you know, those uh, look for your way type of kiosks. And they started using, taking pictures of shoppers and they run through facial recognition because everybody has facial recognition now. And you can assign shoppers based on age and category and basically doing market segmentation. Now jokes on them, they don't need that information. They don't need to look in your face in order to look for this type of information. Most uh, marketers can actually figure most of this out by just using your post code. I'm not kidding. Um, so they, this is where how your information is being used, what information is being captured, and how it's being processed. Who knows? Nobody's looking at them. And finally, another example here is that there's a healthcare system that uses um, uh, algorithms in order to target high-risk patients for more aggressive and attent uh, for attentive care. So these folks, Optum of Eden Prairie, is routinely for millions of patients so that you can actually, when you're, when you're using algorithms to target high-risk patients, you're basically in unintentionally producing racial biases or other types of biases, right? Because the type of, in the, uh, the bias that's exhibited in the algorithm reduces the number of black patients because likely sample size in terms of what type of, uh, what, what type of information is being fed, likely not because of the racial, uh, the, 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 um, the, the racial categories in general, but it's because of the inherent type of uh, risk and the inherent type of information that comes with the, uh, with the racial categorization, right? So how you program has an effect and how you use this information when you're looking at just automating and using artificial intelligence in doing this work has impact. And if you're not looking at, for example, biases, the type of use for what type of privacy considerations, issues happen. And when we look at these type of uh, headlines, it seems very, oh, man, they really should have thought of that. They could have. They chose not to, right? There's a lot of considerations, especially the larger the set, uh, data set that you have, the more considerations you need to have in terms of what it means, the outcome that you're training for. So what does this mean to you? You as physicians will be required to consume an increasing volume of information, consider more and more of artificially, uh, uh, artificial intelligence tools. You will be using all different types of machine learning approaches. You may not even know about it because it may just appear to you as a button. You may not even realize it because it's part of your workflow. Okay? These sessions that are offered by these folks over here is designed to help you to learn at the very least to understand and to discern and interpret what these approaches mean and how when you're in the field, what it means to you and what are some of the biases and what are some of the limitations of these approaches, okay? So I provide you with a brief understanding and initiation of the understanding that's needed. So AI has the potential to revol uh, revolutionize the field of medicine. I would argue that it requires, but it solves problems differently than humans. More so, it requires humans to actually 
program and create these solutions. So you as healthcare workers, technicians, patients, it's important for us to know what that means, what these solutions mean, and to be conversant in the field of AI and medicine. And this course is just to give the essentials, just the initial understanding of how AI and medicine works and to give a basic understanding of the field. Okay. Thank you very much.